Hi, welcome to Relax and Breathe. I'm your host, Pompey Strader Vidal, and today we have a special guest, Brian King. Brian is a mindfulness coach and student of life, and he's with us today. Hello, Brian. Hello, Pompey. It's a joy. I've been looking forward to this. Oh, good. So have I. <laughs> it's kind of relaxing to be able to just do an audio, as we were talking about before. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> and the first thing I wanted to ask you about was because some of the people that are listening to us haven't heard your story before and don't know who you are, so I thought that you could start out by telling us what inspired your work and what you do. What inspired it is necessity. Uh, I was blessed with cancer when I was 18 years old. Didn't have a lot of coping skills, didn't have a very functional family, didn't have much of a support system, but I had all the pain and all the emotional turmoil that goes along with it. So I'm trying to find a way to strike some balance and all that because I was just tired of feeling so out of control. I went to the library and started looking through some self-help, philosophy, religion books, and I stumbled upon some things on Buddhism and this wonderful concept of being in the moment and letting things go and not being attached. And I found that the more that I spent some time with that kind of thinking and really gave myself to it, it really helped me manage all the things I was trying to hold on to. The life I thought that I was losing, you know, fear of what the future might bring. And one way it really came in handy was in managing the pain that comes along with chemotherapy. Because that's one of those things that somebody can really react to. You feel pain and you start awfulizing it and personalizing it and why me? And I went through all that stuff. But once I realized that I could get connected with my breath and just embrace the the inflow and the outflow of breathing, which really connects you to the fact that things come and go. You know, it's a very accessible way of experiencing your body and experiencing life. And by staying tapped into that, it allowed me to see my pain in the same way. It's a sharp pain. It's a dull pain. It came. It went. Oh, great. I didn't have to have a conversation about that at all. You know, it just did what it did, and it went on its way, and life was able to go on. So it made it far easier for me to not get caught up in the negativity of my experience. And life threw me some other curveballs moving forward, uh, finding out that I had undiagnosed ADHD and dyslexia. I have three boys with special needs, a lot of drama dealing with the public school system that goes along with that. And being able to understand the ebb and flow of life and not getting caught up in one thing longer than it deserves really makes resilience a lot easier to come by. And to bring you up to speed, uh, I have a, a genetic condition that affects my connective tissue, my joints, my ligaments. So I'm in constant pain. You know, the past couple of days have been incredibly rough. And yeah, there have been some times where I felt like breaking down and crying or, you know, and, and whatnot. But I remembered to go back to my breathing, remind myself, this is a bump in the road. This is some turbulence we're going through, but this too shall pass. And just staying connected to that because otherwise it's so easy to get sucked into it. Well, you know. Ryan, that as a Zen monk, this is very dear to my heart, what you're sharing. <laughs> I just have to say that because I teach people this and I also work, you know, as a psychotherapist and I have other traditions that are woven through my work. But I feel like you're really talking to the essence of what I try to get across to people which is the value of being able to be in the present moment and the value of a meditation practice and mindfulness practice 
to carry you through your life no matter what gets thrown at you because you know all of us experience the challenges some of them are more difficult than others but I just want to thank you for sharing your story because it's very heartfelt. Absolutely. And now I wanted to see, because I know that you, we were talking the other day and we were talking about um, how you use meditation. And I know that you have like a free gift for us called Everyday Mindfulness. But I just wanted to see if you could offer like a simple technique that you have in your skill set that people could use for themselves every day. Absolutely. And it's breathtakingly simple. Great. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big believer in getting laser focused because, and, and I imagine this is your experience too, the more steps a person has to go through to experience results, the easier it is for them to get discouraged. Right. You know, because you mess up one and they throw their hands up, I, I suck at this, you know, why did I even bother? So I think in terms of, again, attaching as much as possible to the breath. So one of the mantras that I recommend is just to breathe in and say to yourself quietly, I love me. And when you exhale, say, I love you. So you understand that love goes both ways. Love begins in your own heart before it can be extended out, and always as much as possible, staying in that place of love really helps put things in perspective. Oh, I think that's beautiful. I really like that, and I like the way that you connect the message of love with the practice of being in the present moment. Um, I feel that one, you know, the current teachers, Buddhist teachers, Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh, um, they carry that message through loving kindness. And, you know, some people miss that in Buddhist practice. They don't understand the connection of an open heart and being in the present moment. There's a lot that gets missed depending on the tradition that some people mistakenly think that you're not supposed to feel. Right. You know, you're not supposed to have any desires. When the reality is, is that you know, desires are healthy. It's a matter of thinking that life isn't good enough unless all of your desires are fulfilled. That's where you start having suffering. Right. Right. But, yeah. In the moment, coming from that place of wanting to express love in the world, of gratitude, of kindness, those are moment-to-moment -moment decisions. And again, just like a breath. They happen quickly. You don't have to attach to them. You don't have to attach to the outcome. You're simply putting them out there. Right. And I like that. I like the way that you call that laser focus. <laughs> because I agree with you. I think that that's true. People, um, you know, people take a lot of time to express things that can be put very succinctly and more efficiently. And I have to ask you a question, Brian. I'm curious about your own personal practice. Is everything that you learned, did it all come from um, your own personal study or did you have a teacher? Oh yeah, my first teacher was in the early 90s, American Zen master. He since passed on. And once you get into the practice, you realize just how much work you have to do. Because I, I know people that have read a lot about mindfulness and then want to go and hang their shingle out as a mindfulness coach because the reading makes them feel good. And what they don't realize is that it's not about attaching to ideas. You know, it's about being at home with what's happening between your two ears, whether it's muddy or whether it's shiny. And being able to still come from a peaceful place. And I really learned that just by getting my butt on the cushion and getting instructions from my teacher. When I'd say, oh, I felt so relaxed, I felt so peaceful, he'd say, great, let it go. That's not the point. It's not about achieving some sense of bliss or relaxation. Those experiences might show up, but some other gremlins might show up too. And you know what? That's okay. 
It's about being the observer of your life, not getting caught up in it, not wishing for anything special to happen, but just being with it. And I don't know that I really could have grasped that and really taken it into my gut by just reading a book. You really have to just sink into it and do the work. And I, of course, completely agree with you. <laughs> and uh, I think it's true. Uh, you know, a lot of times, unfortunately, it takes pain and suffering to motivate people to uh, practice and get on the cushion or sit in the chair or uh, make time for uh, mindfulness practice in their life every day. I tell people if that they can if just commit to 10 minutes a day and establish that, that, you know, that's a good starting point. Uh, what do you recommend for people? Oh, I'm, we're on the same page because <laughs> it's, it's about quality over quantity. You know, there are right. people that can be sitting on the cushion for a, an hour at a time and most they did is fight their mind or they found a state of relaxation that they did their darndest to stay in and then they reemerge only to be pissed off at life again. Right. So it's the quality of your attention, the quality of your ability to just be there with whatever's happening and be a part of the audience instead of an actor in the play. Uh, and you can do that in 5, 10, 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be an all-day endeavor. Right, which is right. You're talking about developing the observer, which is a lot of spiritual practices. That's what it's called, observing yourself. And I call it, a lot of times, because I'm also trained in psychology and psychotherapy, I call that a process of disidentifying. So that instead of identifying with your suffering, instead of being attached to your experience, you just let it go from moment to moment. Yeah. Well, I uh, I have my master's in social work. Oh, nice. And and <laughs> I imagine it's probably the same concept. Yeah. But a term that that I learned was externalization. Right. Mm -hmm. you, know, you put it outside yourself, and instead of something you are, it now becomes something you have a relationship with. Right. And it's very powerful. But again, it can really be reduced to a simple intellectual exercise. You know, it's when you find some additional tools like you and I have acquired over the years that can really make that process or that idea much more powerful. Right. And I personally feel that that's one of the important and unique aspects of American Zen. My teacher was Japanese, my Roshi, and he came over to the U.S., you know, with Suzuki Roshi to help... Um, set up Tassahara. And so he was from a family tradition in Japan. And, uh, but he loved the U.S. and he loved the fact that Zen was coming to the U.S. And I feel like in US, here what's happened is it's merged with psychology and it's also merged with the American culture where uh, the people that practice Zen are also in the world earning a living and having families and having all the joys and struggles of living the life of what's called a lay, you know, a lay person. Yeah. And I think that that makes it more powerful. He felt like that made it more powerful. Absolutely. I mean, the, my first teacher, his teacher was raised in a Japanese monastery and came here to America to set up shop. And, I recently connected with another uh, American Zen master, and we had a very similar conversation about how patriarchal the Japanese tradition is, right? and how they spend most of their time in the monastery, and it's very difficult to generalize a lot of the teachings to everyday life, but in America, they need a much more laser-focused, practical approach to mindfulness, right? and it's like the same that anything happens with any spiritual tradition, whereas it needs to adapt and meld itself with the, the culture in order to be accepted by it. Right. 
So in many ways, you hope a tradition is enhanced in some way by it. And, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, American Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, yeah, they're all Buddhism, but they're going to have very different flavors. Right. Right. I live in Boulder, and we have a large Tibetan community here. We actually have the Dalai Lama coming on June 23rd. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, he's he's like a rock star here. The tickets went on sale at CU, our local university, and it was like people were like jamming to get them. It was great. That's wonderful. I know, and to me it's amazing to see how it's grown because I remember when he first came, it was in the early 1980s, and he spoke at a much smaller venue at CU, and there were just a handful of people there, and now he's a rock star. <laughs> the, the best way to describe what I do is that I help people move from suffering to love. Great. Because... So much, you know, the American lifestyle is, is very competitive, very one-upsmanship, you know, very self-centered in many ways. And people can experience themselves as being left out, picked last, unloved. And what they don't realize is that so much of the decisions they've made, the conclusions they've drawn, are the reason for their suffering. Not because love is not available but because of where they've taught themselves they fit in the scheme of things. So one of the main things I help them do is to, first and foremost, with meditation, with basic mindfulness strategies, to get in touch with that conversation. The one that their brain is churning day in and day out that is responsible for a lot of the suffering they're having. And once they're able to be an observer of it, and realize, man, this is not me. This is not who I am. It's all this stuff that's just churning. Right. Then I help them gradually remove the layers of the onion till they can start discovering that authentic capacity for love within themselves. And then we start talking about how do you now make that an active part of your everyday way of being in the world? And one thing that's really fun is... I do it all virtually. I can do it over audio. I can do it over Skype. And with my health challenges, one thing I stumbled across, again, by necessity, is with, especially with my international clients, Right. the time zone differences can be very prohibitive when it comes to regular sessions. Right. But they'll send me an email describing their challenge, and I will respond to them with an audio file. So they can hear my tone, I can facilitate, I can do a guided meditation, and it's like we're in the same room together and they can play it over and over again. It's not dependent on us being at the same place at the same time. And I'm able to help a lot more people while still taking care of myself because I'm not pushing through the pain when I should be resting. Right. I know. I think that's one of the amazing gifts of technology, you know. I was talking to, with a speaker yesterday, and she works with energy medicine, and we were talking about the pluses and minuses of technology in our lives. And what you're describing now is the plus. <laughs> because some of the people that are listening now are from around the world. We have an international community here as well. So it's pretty magical when it's working well the um the way that you can um you know share knowledge and experience it's amazing absolutely and and i just sent this out to my newsletter list today talking about how pain is becoming my best teacher because you don't have this boundless energy where you're just looking for every opportunity to be noisy and throw more stuff out there in the conversation. You get a little bit more choosy when you have limited strength. You know, say, mm, can I whine? You know, what am I going to complain? Is anybody going to care? I'm going to put some love out there. Am I going to put something of value before I go and lay my head down on the pillow again? And people would be amazed just how how much easier it is to think in a qualitative way when 
you're put in a position where it's, is this worth putting out there? Is this going to make it better? If not, don't do anything. Be quiet. Well, that sounds like a very Zen approach that you're describing here, Brian. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 really being hit home a lot more lately too. Right, because of your your experience in your body and and the, the reality of it. It's like, well, you know this from your um, studies. It's a be it's mm-hmm. a reality check, right? Yeah. yeah, and I know people throughout history, you know, in in the present who go through a lot more pain than I do. And is, is this my dream life? Not even close. But as long as this is my reality, I have really got to dig in and make it useful because I'm not going to spend the rest of my life feeling like a victim. Right. There's simply no use in that. Right. Well, thank you so much. You know, when people are listening to this on the page right now, they're going to be able to see your bio. They're going to be able to, they're looking at it right now. <laughs> and they can see uh, the, the link to your free gift. And they, can, they should be able to see a link to your website. And I know you also do a podcast, correct? Right. Uh, and it's the podcast is very much in... In the same spirit as what we were doing now, it's Memoirs of a Mindful Life, where I'm just sharing stories of how either in my work with my clients, raising my kids, or just my own experience, I've had to learn to incorporate it and deepen my practice when I'm in the mud as well as when I'm in the sunlight, because it's all usable material. It's all good stuff. You know, it's... It's not just all those sunshiny days and, you know, I get to complain when it's raining outside. No, it's, it's all got to be useful. That's where the really deep work happens. Right. It's just like the symbol in Buddhist um, philosophy of the lotus. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Yeah, that's in the mud and then rises up out of the water and is yeah. pure. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. <laughs> my, my absolute pleasure, Poppy. I hope we get to do this again. I hope so, too. I hope that uh, Relax and Breathe will become an annual event. <laughs> well, care. we're definitely off to a strong start, huh? Yes. All right. So we're going to sign off for now, but thank you again, and have a great day. To you as well. Bye-bye.